All right, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, Tenex Health has sponsored this webinar to talk about our technology for the treatment of uh, tenotomy with percutaneous ultrasound as well as fasciotomy. We thank you for being here. For those of you on the East Coast, we know this is just the beginning of getting into your, your personal and family time for the evening, so we are grateful that you're here with us and want to be respectful of your time tonight. And for those of you on the West, we know that you're just now starting to finish up your, your afternoon, you finish up your day, and we appreciate you taking some time out of your work schedule to be with us. Uh, my name is Keith Taylor. I'm with 10X Health. Again, welcome to all of you. Uh, we are very excited tonight to have two esteemed speakers with us to talk about uh, the 10X technology. We have Dr. Bernie Mori. Dr. Mori is the Chief Medical Officer of 10X Health as well as the Emeritus Chairman and Professor of Orthopedics at the Mayo Clinic and at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in San Antonio. He has served on the Board of Governors of the Mayo Clinic and is the past president of the Ortho American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And our other esteemed guest and speaker tonight is Dr. Champ Baker. Dr. Baker is a staff physician at the Houston Clinic in Columbus, Georgia and a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the Medical College of Georgia. He's the chair of the board of directors of the Houston uh, Foundation, and uh, Dr. Baker has been past president of the Houston Clinic, as well as the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. We appreciate and are grateful that both of our speakers are here this evening to, to share their wisdom on 10X technology. Uh, before I hand it over to Dr. Bernie, I would like to let you all know that we do have the ability through the webinar for you to ask questions. Uh, as Dr. Mori and Dr. Baker are presenting tonight. You can do that in the menu bar. Uh, usually it will show up on either the right or left side of your screen. It's the GoToWebinar control panel. There is a portion there called questions, and you just type in your question there, and then towards the, uh, after Dr. Baker and Dr. Mori both get done presenting this evening, I will go through with and uh, make sure that we get your questions answered. And then at the very end of the call after that, we will open up the microphones for a, an open live Q&A. Uh, we do ask that you really try to get most of your questions typed in through the GoToWebinar uh, control panel as uh, it can get a little chaotic when we open up all of the, uh, the phone lines at the end and it can get a little noisy. When we do that, we do ask that uh, at the end of the call when we open up all of the phones, take everybody off of mute, that if you are not speaking at the moment, if you could please put your personal phone that you are on on mute, that will really help you keep the noise level down. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Moore. Thanks very much, Keith, and good evening, everybody, or good afternoon if you're on the West Coast. I'd just like to echo what Keith said. I mean, as uh, being so busy in my, my clinical practice through my career, I know the ability to take any time off whether it's in the evening or in the middle of the day or the morning or almost any time, you just, you just don't have it. So for those that are logged on, we truly appreciate your taking the time and effort to uh, take the time to listen to what uh, we're, we're about to discuss with you. And uh, I also want to just uh, reiterate how pleased we are to have Dr. Baker involved with 10X and as my colleague. I'm not sure if it was clear, but Champ is the Associate Medical Director of 10X also. And so uh, he's been a, a friend throughout my career. And 10X is very, very fortunate to have someone of his stature and credibility to be uh, involved with our, uh, with our emerging technology. Let me just introduce this. By, I'm going to say just a word about even why I'm involved. And um, our founder, uh, Juggy Gill, likes to, to kind of tell the story. but you know, I, I was not looking for anything to do, quite frankly, but he presented this idea that we're going to share with you tonight, and I remember after he was done, he said, what do you think? And I remember almost word for word, I said, listen, if this thing A really works and B is really safe and C can really save society some money and people can tolerate it, then it's a game changer. And so he said, okay. And then he came back and we kind of worked on it and discussed it and he kind of, you might say, sucked me in because it turns out that all the things that I said, if it could happen, I think it's going to make a difference. I think, I think it's happening, but that's what we'll share with you and you can kind of decide for yourself. So 
the, the presentation has two, kind of two components. I'm going to kind of share some of the rationale, some of the background, some of the uh, kind of ep uh, epidemiology kind of things, the, the burden of the disease and how this fits in, in one's armamentarium for caring, these, caring for these patients. And then CHAMP will talk about our clinical experience and some of the techniques and then we look forward to your questions. So with that, as you might imagine, uh, we have relevant financial interests. Uh, I am the medical direct director and CHAMP is the associate medical director uh, for 10X Health. Everybody that's on this call, I think, is on the call because you realize this slide is the burden of disease of tendinopathy is really pretty substantive. In 2013, there was over 30 million codes, ICD-9 codes, that related to tendinopathy somewhere, chronic tendinopathy, not acute. And so you can see that as an office visit, as a preponderance of, 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 uh, of uh, significant musculoskeletal morbidity, tendinopathy really is a real issue. And we all know, everybody that's on the call knows that we really don't have a perfect solution except wait it out and do eccentric exercises. And so if we can have an intervention that is early, that's as effective as surgery and, and um, it doesn't have some of the morbidity, that would really be attractive. One of the things that's been, I think, I think is important and is helpful for me to try to understand what's going on is you know, if, if we look at what is tendinopathy all about, and, and we have an intact tendon, and there's some form of an insult that occurs, and it could be a chronic repetitive with, with certain type of athletic activities, or it could be a single event. Usually, it's, it's chronic repetitive. But there is some form of an injury to the tendon, and then there is a neurovascular response that mediates what happens. And, and during the process, Many people will say, wait it out, they all get better. And, we, and we, we support that. We understand that and we believe that. Uh, and that's because the body does recognize the injury, the insult, and it sounds that, sends out a reparative signal. And that reparative signal in the lower right-hand corner results in healing of the process. But it doesn't always happen. And in some instances, there is some form of a chronic refractory process called degenerative tendinopathy that occurs at some point, meaning that it lost the signal and is not going to get any better, at least not in the short term. And we don't know if that's a year or what it is, and we'll talk about some data that, that, that addresses this issue. At, at Mayo, we looked at a decade, 10 years experience with epicondylitis being seen by physicians at Mayo, and here's what we found, and this is the first time that it's ever been described, it was described in March of this year in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, that if a person still had symptoms at six months, and 80% of uh, eighty percent did resolve, like everybody thinks, but one out of five, 20% still have symptoms, and if you're in that 20%, so that you have not resolved at six months, then the average time for you to heal is more than two years. So if you're in that six month bullseye, then you better settle in because it's not going to go away for most people for a long period of time. The other thing that is always talked about, or it's not actually, it's rarely talked about, but, but is always known with no hard data is the recurrence rate. And we found at Mayo, in the, or at least in Olmstead County, where Mayo Clinic is, that one out, of, one out of every six patients that spontaneously heals also spontaneously recurs. So that's not trivial. So one in six will recur, and the average time to healing after six months, if you still have symptoms in six months, you're looking at another two years. So that, that tells us that... Um, you can't just say, wait it out, everybody heals in a year, because that's far from the truth. So what we would consider treatment nirvana as we look at these patients, whether it be the elbow, the knee, the foot and ankle, is just think if you could definitively treat somebody so it's one and done, and if you could do it early, not necessarily at a month or two months or three months, but where it's still early enough to where they haven't given up months and months and months of their livelihood or their recreational activity, um, 
and you're not jeopardizing anything by intervening early, so you can intervene early. If you do it in a way that it doesn't, it actually drives down the cost, and ideally if there's no complications, or almost none. That to me is treatment nirvana. That's really what you would really hope we could do, not just for tendinopathy, for, but for a lot of the chronic repetitive overuse things, which usually is a tendinopathy. So what are our options now? Well, many will recognize the gold standard is actually eccentric exercises. I mean, we hate to see these patients in our office because we so often we know we don't want to operate on them, and we know that um, uh, we're, if we give them some activity, they're going to come back. But but we do send them to physical therapy. They give them the eccentric exercises. The vast majority. This is the treatment standard, and there's data that shows that this does stimulate that reparative signal and gets it started again. Uh, however, how effective it is is a function of the sites. It's quite variable for Achilles tendon versus a, uh, a tendinopathy of the epicondylitis. But it is safe. It is prolonged, and the cost is variable. If you're going and seeing somebody, it's expensive. If you do it on your own, it's less expensive. Uh, the, the standard is really cortisone injection for the really hot tendinopathy at almost any anatomic site. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, very prone towards cortisone injection because Almost nobody on this call realizes, except maybe me and Champ, that um, cortisone was actually uh, discovered at Mayo Clinic. It's the only Nobel Prize ever won by a Mayo Clinic investigator. So it, it hurts me to say that it's probably not a good idea for tendinopathy. There's emerging data that shows that cortisone, compared to eccentric exercises or nothing, is much better short-term, no better long-term, and probably worse long-term than nothing or eccentric exercises. In fact, the point is cortisone long-term may be detrimental because the healing may be prolonged. So just for whatever it's worth, for the last three years since these data came out, I've really quit using cortisone for tendinopathy. Um, I'm, I'm not sure it's in my patient's best interest, so I quit, I quit using it. And there's actually very strong and emerging data to support that. Uh, many of you on the call will um, have been using or are using a PRP, and we understand <clears throat> there's a lot of industry interest, a lot of science, a lot of uh, 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 rationale for that. It makes a lot of sense. We also know there's a little complex. A lot of different companies have different approaches. and um, and we also know that the response is somewhat variable. If you look at the literature, Mafuli, a uh, pretty well recognized uh, foot and ankle guy from the UK, originally from Italy, he's a friend of mine and I, I know him pretty well. And he's looked up the uh, experience with Achilles tendon and you see here, it just recently, the best evidence says that PRP really doesn't have any benefit for Achilles. Now people that are listening in might say, that's not been my experience and that's just fine. But at very best, we can say that it's variable. And then if we look at an uh, um, aggregate of experiences, it's, it's better than 50%, maybe 60, in some instances higher, some instances lower. In this 2011 meta-analysis, in the JBJS said no proof of efficacy. But you know, it's safe. So people continue to use it almost in desperation. And the thing that bothers me is it's out of pocket and I can't offer somebody confident intervention, uh, and it's not even covered. So, so it has its issues. But if you're on the call and you say it's worked well for me, then I think that's really good. I do think there's something there, and I think it'll emerge over time how, how and when to use it. Other options are um, uh, the agents that are used percutaneously, PRP, stem cell, Botox, acupuncture, dry needle you, and there's more than that. There's also wave therapy. Uh, ultrasound has been used or, or, or wave therapy of some form, of some frequency for quite a while and everybody is familiar with the efforts in extracorporeal shock wave to intervene particularly in Achilles and in uh, tendonitis at the elbow. It's been variably reported. Many of you or some of you at least may have used topaz. Uh, when I've uh, asked people are they still using it, most have given it up. Uh, they, it has caused tendon ruptures. It does cause, it does require a uh, anesthetic or at least a conscious sedation. So 
and that's not necessarily minimally invasive, but but it does impart a high, an ultrasonic type of energy to the tendon, and in, um, in, in can be effective. But what we're going to be talking about tonight is wave therapy that is really different. It's really different, uh, at least for the tendinopathy, because it's percutaneous. It's just like a cortisone injection. Uh, it goes through the skin, and we impart the energy uh, with this uh, needle. It's an 18-gauge needle. The differences are will be obvious as we continue to discuss this, but as you see on the right-hand panel, we use an ultrasound sensor to see where we are, which we think is really important, and then we impart the energy that has certain characteristics. Now, this thing got approved in less than a year, the FDA, and the reason for it is the predicate was ophthalmology. And you may know, uh, or you may have heard of FACO. That's FACO emulsification. FACO is ultrasound energy to the lens to remove a cataract. And there's over 20 years experience with this. And it's changed the treatment paradigm of, of ophthalmology, as many of you probably know. And it's been demonstrated over and over and over and over again a, in clinical practice to be both effective but equally importantly safe. And so not only did it change the paradigm, that was actually the basis for us going forward and saying substantially equivalent. And if you do any joint replacements or are involved in very many other orthopedic innovations, you know that we almost always have to use another orthopedic device. And I found this really interesting that Dr. Gill, our founding um, uh, person, um, used FACO as the substantially equivalent. And that's almost to use a a device or, or a technique in another discipline is really, really rare, uh, but that, that's how it happened. So the, the question that we often get answered, asked is, um, how does it work? And the, the central guiding principle is cells are very sensitive to energy. And if you impart energy in the region of a cell wall, you can disrupt it. But the reality is nobody really knows how FACO works let alone how this works. But the irony of it is we know it does work. And so I've talked to numerous ophthalmologists here at Mayo. I'm at Mayo right now. And one of the world's renowned ultrasound uh, uh, investigators is here, and I, Jim Greenleaf, and I said, how does it work? And they just kind of smile and they say, well, we're not quite sure. But here are the two theories. One of them is called cavitation, which means that when the ultrasound energy gets imparted into a system or a field or an environment, it creates little nitrogen bubbles, and those bubbles expand into the tissues, and when they burst, they create an energy uh, uh, level, and that energy actually disrupts the membranes of the surrounding cells. That's the top part of this slide, and that's called cavitation. And almost anybody that uses ultrasound, when you ask them how does it work, they'll say, well, we think it's cavitation. The others, which are probably going to be more the orthopedic surgeons given our personalities, well, it's just a mechanical. It's a jackhammer effect. The ultrasound imparts this um, wave that act just actively, directly disrupts cells, but, but we don't know. Uh, this is a study that is really important to try to understand how our technology works in this system of tendinopathy. Uh, one of my former fellows working at the University of Kentucky did an animal study where he uh, degenerated the, set, the tendon of a, of a rabbit and then he treated it with 10x and what these slides show, collagen 1 and collagen 3 panels returned to essentially normal within three weeks. So what he showed is he can take a degenerative tendon, he can emulsify it, he can suck it out and remove it, and then he can go back and study that tendon and it looks like a tendon. So that is very confirmatory to the hypothesis of what was happening clinically, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. But it stimulates a healing response, and that's really key because that's how we think patients are experiencing the outcome. So what is this all about? There's a, there's a console that's made by 10X that imparts the energy, and this energy uh, amount has been studied and optimized to be effective against diseased degenerative tissue based on a harmonic resonance concept 
that normal tissue has a certain resilience to energy and degenerative tissue has a different reaction. And, and there's a differential there that is wide enough to allow our energy level to be selectively effective against degenerative tissue. So, and then on the right there's a panel that just shows a normal tendon that had uh, on the top that then had the 10x energy exposed to it continuously for seven seconds and shows some wavy bundles but no ruptures. So it's not a gamma knife, it doesn't cut through normal tissue. Um, it seems to selectively uh, seek out and remove the degenerative tissue. It's, so here's the way it works. That on the upper left-hand side, you see uh, in the lower part, you see uh, an 18 gauge needle, and that's what it is. And on there, there's an outer sleeve, and through the outer sleeve, the uh, the probe, the, the the needle is irrigated. So that keeps it cool and keeps it from causing any heat kind of complications. But in the center, it's hollow, and there's a suction that's applied. And so while you're emulsifying or cutting through the degenerative tissue. You suck it out and remove it. And on the right-hand panel, you see a little bag that comes with the whole system. And you see tissue that's actually in the bag because it got sucked out through the probe. And so the reason that this is really very different from all other wave therapy is it removes the degenerative tissue. And there's only one other basic treatment option or strategy that does that, and it's called surgery. So here's the first, and in, honest to God, there's a little bit of problem even with the coating because it's so different. This is the only instance that I know of where you do a percutaneous surgical procedure. Now you can say percutaneous anatomy is a surgical procedure, and I accept that. So I should modify and say it's the only instance in which you can do a debridement percutaneously. Otherwise, everybody knows on the call debridement's an open procedure, uh, but it's a little different here. And so this really lessens the impact of the stage of the disease. Remember the early slide where you have the, the uh, insult and then there's a reparative signal and then over a period of time it'll either heal or not. And I think this is why there's variable response to PRP. And, and what we think is happening here, or what we are sure is happening is after treatment here, the degenerative tendon is gone and it probably has a little clot that forms in the area. And now every patient that is treated is at the same stage of the disease process, which means a healing signal has been imparted. There's a blood clot that brings in the healing factors, and now that tendon starts to heal. But unlike almost any other treatment except surgery, the bad stuff, the degenerative tendon, is gone. Uh, when you inject PRP or do anything else, the degenerative tendon is still there, and the cytokines are still there, and the products of degenerative tendons are still there, but, but not with this technology. So that gives you a little bit of a background of um, how this works and the rationale. And then the, the logical thing that we would ask appropriately is, well, show me the data and uh, what's been your experience to date, and then maybe a little bit about technique. And so I'm going to turn those kind of questions over to my friend Champ, who will kind of discuss uh, our uh, experience recognize this has only been out about three or four years, so there's not a there's not a wealth of opportunity to have documentation. But Champ will review what documentation we do have as a company, and then discuss a little bit about technique, and then we can uh, open it up for questions. So Champ, it's all yours. Ernie, thank you. I, I wish also to, to talk about how I got involved with 10x, and, and Ernie, you may not. Well, I'm sure you do remember this, but. 1991, I first uh, arthroscopically resected the ECRB on a, ten, on a patient with tennis elbow and, and began a, a several year project of doing cataract studies to see if that was, uh, you could do it, how safe it's successful. We eventually published our results. And I first presented the shoulder and elbow closed meeting. And Dr. Morey was my first questionnaire. His question after presenting was, had one question. He said, Why? It was, why do you do this? And, and that's always sort of haunted me because, of course, I had to explain why. And I thought it was, and I still think it's a good way to treat recalcitrant tendinopathy. Fast forward to two years ago, we were both on a panel that was looking at various ways to treat latipocondylitis tennis elbow. And, 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 and I was the arthroscopic resection. There was somebody with open. And Bernie presented his early experience on using tennis. And it is intriguing. And I've done enough tennis elbow arthroscopy. I know how it works. But it's overkill on some patients who can be treated another way. 
And so my question to him was, he said, well, pretty interesting, show me the data. And about six months later here, I started getting a lot of data about 10x treatment, successful treatment. And I became convinced from the data, and I started using the technique. And in my experience, it is a very effective technique. So we want to share you some of the uh, some of the written uh, results, and then we'll share a little bit of our personal experience how this uh, technique does work for tendinopathy or, or tendinosis. And if we've divided in epicondylitis, which is going to be medial or lateral, jumper's knee, Achilles, and then uh, the plantar fasciitis. We'll talk a little bit about maybe where the future may go. Well, uh, this was an article published by Coe in the, in the journal. But what's interesting about this, this is the first 20 patients that they did. It's a Singapore study. And what you see is that over time, the visual analog, the dash score, obviously dropped and stayed down. They followed these patients out to three years. And what's intriguing, not just the results, no complications, no device complications, no patient-related, all patients satisfied. But if you look at, at the effect is this on the top left at zero is the ultrasound uh, at the time of, uh, of treatment. And, and, and what we see on this color generator is, is the amount of pathology. You drop down the left at, at three months, they went back and looked at these patients at three months. They looked at them again on ultrasound, not treated them, again at six months and again at 36 months. So uh, what you treat for tendonitis, as you know, is resection of the tissue. And inadequate resection leaves you with a less than optimal uh, score, less than optimal results. You've got to get all the pathology out. This, I think, is the only technique I know that allows you to see the pathology and confirm it's been removed. If you do it arthroscopically, uh, you sort of know what you're shaving, but you can't tell. If you do it open, the tissue may look and feel a little different, but it's sometimes difficult to say exactly what extent. You know, there have been some articles that, that you can do it. Resected, but this lets you look at the tissue. So this to me is a very effective, a very uh, telling study that, that looked back at three years and showed that it not only was effective, but it stayed effective. Well, uh, I've already talked about the one, the type one and type two collagen study that's been submitted uh, in the animal study that you can regenerate your tissue. Uh, Cole, the study we talked about, 36 uh, months follow-up, again, looking at ultrasonography to see and the tissue was gone. Well, Barnes out of, out of Mayo just published the children of this year, a prospective study. But what's interesting now, he did both medial and lateral tendonitis, not just lateral tendonitis, but they were medial in, in mixed out of 19 patients. One year follow up, and again, satisfactory 88% of these patients, again, with no complications. So we see that, as we know, tendonitis does not favor one side of the arm, it's an involvement of, of the tendons. So the, the medial flexor muscle can be involved, not as much but it looks like you can be treated just as successfully with this device. Um, sports physicians are excited to know that perhaps we have a treatment for jumpers knee. If you're involved in any athletic pursuit, you've got athletes that persist at jumping, not just basketball, but track and field, and other athletes, even runners, they can get or do get irritation of patella tendon insertion and can be quite disabled and chronic. Stowers just submitted his work, looked at 10 patients two year, for a whole year follow and returned satisfactory eight out of eight. My experience, I've done, uh, I've done all the, I've done all joints, if you would, I've done elbow, ankle, plantar fascia, patella tendon. Patella tendon seems to be one that works very well. Uh, and Neil Elitrash has got a study along with his, his uh, physician, sports medicine physician, Jim Andrews is doing the same. Uh, and they'll, we hope to have their, their results for publication soon. But again, it looks like at a year follow-up, these patients that are recalcitrant treatment often 85% satisfactory. Other things perhaps that can be done is conjunction, whether you want to then add stem cells or add PRP. It has to be worked out. But perhaps once you get the cavitation, a PRP injection may be beneficial. People are looking at that right now. But the technique does work just to resect the tissue. We go down, these are three articles. One is by Freed, who's a part of our consultant board. And he has done that. He is a podiatrist, 36 patients, 92% satisfactory Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis. This is by, by an uh, interventional radiologist, 100 patients, 90% uh, satisfactory. And then the uh, last is a uh, orthopedic surgeon, plantar fasciitis. Uh, again, X results in one year. So three disciplines, family physician, sports physician, radiologist, and orthopedic surgeon, have all used this around the ankle and gotten 
uniformly good results for this chronic pain that patients have. So what do we see as a treatment? Well, we found about the first month, three or four weeks, 20% of them will be, quote, cured. Pain will be gone. They'll be very pleased. They'll say, thank you very much. About another 80% will go out another couple, two per month. So you've got to tell patients, you may find that 80% of the patients will find their cure level at about two months. And another 10% may uh, another we catch between two or three months, a little beyond three months. So what I tell patients before I start, I say you may get a successful treatment right away, but you may find it may take another month or two for all your treatment to go as the tendon tends to regenerate as nature reheals that, that tissue. So you don't give up on it right away. We do know, as Bernie talked about, uh, it is a safe, uh, there's no collateral uh, damage to, to other tissue. Uh, on your machine, you have a cutoff, energy cutoff. And oftentimes, I've found that the aspiration will cease. You may clog it up if you've got big humps. And so you've got to just push the button and, and let the water flow to get the tissue out. The big advantage, I can't emphasize enough, is you see the pathology. One of my first patients didn't do as well as I thought. She's a lot better, but she's not 100%. Cured. And I know that I was not in the right spot. I was short. We're going to talk in a minute about the technique. Uh, the needle's only one inch, and I probably was a little more than one inch away from tissue, so I didn't get it all. So you've got to see the pathology, which you can. You've got to reach it with the needle, which you can. And then the machine does the work. And again, it only works on the genitive tissue. Complications, well, and Bernie, I've talked about this, and, and I think he's got a great, a great uh, way to look at this. It, if you had a, a, a treatment that was 100% successful, no matter who you treated for, uh, but maybe 10% of those folks would have complications and, and, and maybe a major, uh, very few of us would say, well, I think I want to try that. If you had a treatment that is 100% safe and you found your success rate 80 to maybe 90%, I think most of us say, you know, if it's safe, I think I will try that. So what we've found is uh, over, uh, this slide says 25, we're up to 30,000 worldwide. Let's see complications, uh, we've only got six. It may be more, but this is all. And these are some real good observers that are using the machine early on. There was a tendon rupture, which may have been complicated by other medication. Two nerve injuries, which resolved, uh, related to the lidocaine injection. Two infections, both did require IND. This has to be done on sterile technique, although this does not require an operating theater. And one skin blister, so extremely safe, very safe uh, technique. Uh, we talked about the distribution, uh, and Bernie talked about procedures, uh, uh, what you get on the codes. Well, of those 30,000 procedures the last three years, 40% uh, come from the elbow, predominantly lateral, uh, some medial. Uh, the knees 5%, Achilles is 15 Plantar fascia is getting more and more uh, utilized because uh, people are finding it's a very effective way to treat calcium and plantar fasciitis, which almost everyone can get or will get during their lifetime. It does take a long time to resolve. You know. We've got gluteus medius up here. Uh, we are looking now with the, uh, we're going to come out hopefully in the first of, of next year, maybe in quarter two, uh, TX2, which would be a longer needle, a two inch needle. Um, the tendon and its attachment to the bone is the same on ultrasound, whether it's the elbow, the ankle, the heel, or the knee, and, and the hip. As you look on a profile, it's a tendon insertion. Uh, that has abnormal signal seen on ultrasound, and your machine reaches it and does the multiplication and resects it. So I'm excited that we've got a needle that we can start treating gluteus medius tendonitis because I do treat bursitis of the hip and see a lot of hip bursitis. Well, we're also excited about this shoulder. Um, we can treat other pathologies. There, there are treatments for uh, these other entities, but not as good as this, but the shoulder, it's got a partially rotated cuff tear, perhaps a bursa-sided tear or a ticker-sided tear. It's not broken through. Um, you're really limited in what you can do. I mean, uh, just decompression is not indicated. Uh, just shaving, it doesn't really do much. And so a surgical intervention is usually not required, and you don't want to keep injecting the so the injections aren't really that efficacious. So patients that have a chronic partial tear just nag on and off. Well, we're going to hopefully uh, indicate a study and start looking at, at utilization of 10x2 uh, in the shoulder in the future and see how efficacious it may be. Because this would be, as Bernie said, a game changer. If we can treat tendonitis anywhere in the body, we can reach it. 
with this technique, and we think that it's very plausible. And it's a money changer. Workers' Comp, uh, the study done by the Work Loss Institute, uh, $3.5 million. Tendon injury, I'm sure it's more than that. Conservative treatment for a tennis, again, this patient is now out of work, so that's why it's 14,000 in this study. You did an open arthroscopically or scope, uh, 70,000. Continue treatment after treatment because they're hard to work, they're missing work, the cost goes up over 30,000. 10x at a surgery center, uh, almost 6,000. In the office, 4,900. So 10x uh, in this in this in this uh, book study that Flannery did is cheaper than conservative treatment of almost 10,000. It's almost 30,000, well, $27,000 less expensive than surgical treatment for the same pathology. And that's what's really gotten me intrigued. We're operating with a needle now, a subcutaneous, and uh, and I, I am I am really excited about where we may go from here. He showed you the picture. Here's, here's the machine. Uh, here's the console, tennis console, and here's the dials on, on the on the on the right. But uh, let's look at epicondylitis. And, and here's here's what we do. The patients in the room. I do mine in, in the hospital, but I do them in one of the waiting rooms. We just patients in there with his family. Uh, this is a right elbow. You use your pen and you uh, you mark out the, uh, the site of maximum tenderness. Uh, because he's awake, we, I didn't mark on here my nurses, but we do do to mark the site. So we mark the tenderness uh, right where we want to put the, uh, uh, the machine. Uh, we localize it with the, with the ultrasound machine. Uh, here's, here's just uh, we saw machine on without the, without the, uh, the lubricant. But so you find the tendon, you find the insertion, the hypochoic signal as it attaches to the uh, bony attachment. So you know right where you are. Uh, I use a little uh, half a set uh, uh, lidocaine as a skin wheel. Uh, again, try to get uh, a little distal, but you want to be able to reach that site of maximum tennis. Once it's numbed up, and go down the bone with your injection so that you filtrate the entire area. A leather blade knife, uh, it's a safe area. And you search a knife down to the bone, so you've got an easy soft tissue egress down to the pathology. And then we bundle up sterilize the, the sterilize. For this purpose, of course, this is not a sterile technique, but you'll sterilize the uh, ultrasound, you put the, uh, you drape, and you pass your, your probe through the little slit you make right to the trigger point area. You can see the tendon coming in, whether you're axial or whether you're longitudinal with the ultrasound, you'll be able to see your needle, need to see your needle, so you can see the uh, disease tendon. And it's a matter of stepping on the foot pedal, uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll hear the noise, you'll see the multiplication, you get little bubbles that come a few times. And, and people, how long do you, do you do it? Well, an elbow is about a minute or a little less, but you're able to observe how much tissue is there, and, and when you, you removed all the disease or, or abnormal appearing tissue is when you can quit. Again, this is one after, after you've been treated. So it's about a minute uh, at pulse time. We, we pulse it. We stop and wait to look. It takes about a minute under local. The patients look at the machine the same time you are. The family's in the room. And it's, it's a very safe and very uh, efficient way to treat this. Uh, we put a little Band-Aid on. Uh, I might put a little sterile strip. The patients go home. Uh, we do tell them uh, first couple of days, just take it easy. Don't do a lot of repetitive work. You, uh, a lot of pet abuse. Try to get your arm into extension. Ice it if you think it's a bother. Tylenol is all we ever think they might require. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the rest of the regimen. But that's for tennis elbow. Media will be the same thing on the medial aspect. You're away from the ulnar nerve. Uh, it's a safe spot. It's a safe. You find the pronator where the pathology is and insert your probe. But tell tendon, again, I've got a tendon inserted to a bony promise just like on the elbow. So we flex the knee. We locate the area just like before. There may be some calcification oftentimes. You know, patellar tendon will ossify as nature's tried to heal that area. Uh, you find normal tendon. If there's calcification there, the needle uh, sometimes will pierce, can even maybe pierce and break it up, but it doesn't seem to make a difference. You don't have to cut it out. Same thing, we inject the skin wheel to numb it up, we pass our blade through, and put our uh, needle, our 18 probe, right up to the pathology, look at it, and then turn on the machine. Very, very safe, very effective. Um, again, the work that, that some are doing and Neil uh, is doing, I think, along with Jimmy, is to perhaps add PRP after this uh, to help maybe get a little more of a healing response. And, and that may be in some instances maybe applicable. 
I think the jury's still out on that because it does add a cost that the patient will have to bear in most in most places. And so I have not done that yet because I've, I've, I've not found the means that patients need that, that added treatment. Plantar fasciitis, if you have patients, and everybody, or you had uh, heel pain, we used to tell them the first year was the worst, so they walk around that boot and limp around. Well, this has been a very effective. I've done this in a couple of patients. Uh, one lady came in, I treated her for, uh, she had an ACL revision, or ACL reconstruction came in, and, and I said, I thought she, you looked like you're limping. I thought we were doing fine. She said, oh, my knee's terrific. He said, I got this plantar fascia. I had two years ago, it's back. I said, I got a deal for you. And so we went pretty quickly on her. And it's amazing how when you say, I have something that works, you pretty much got to have it work because you're doing it under local in front of she or her family. And, um, and we eradicated her pain very quickly. I do them, you can the physician here, they're, they're a prone, and your probe's on the bottom. Again, you look at the osteoscalps, it's the same picture, disease tendon coming in to a bony prominence. Um, you come from the side. Uh, I found these patients, it's tough to really anesthetize. That first needle goes in, it's tough uh, adipose tissue to get down to the, to the tuberosity, and so they're a little more uncomfortable doing this uh, procedure, I think they're young too, because they don't feel a thing at all. But you've got to get a good skin wheel, infiltrate all the way down to localized, down to the uh, plantar fascia insertion, and then put your leather blade knife. And the same technique. As you notice, we've got a vertical and a horizontal axis. You could do one or two planes because it's hard to tell the extent of how broad that involvement may be. And so you need to look at it with your ultrasound in more than one uh, plane to make sure you get all the tissue done. Um, my experience, this is a little thicker tissue to get out than, than the elbow or, or, the, uh, or the knee, and so that may take a little bit longer and be a little more patient to make sure you're at that area. Again, to cover up your site of entry, uh, uh, put them in ice or a walking boot they need. I put them in walking boot for three weeks just to overkill because I don't want them to feel so good they're out walking on this thing without some protection. Achilles, there are several areas in the Achilles that you can do, whether it's an insertional tendinopathy, if it's not that bad, and the tendon itself, is, they're not a big bone spur there, or just the substance of the tendon before it's through rupture. Same thing, you mark here. You may find more than one point. Here we mark two spots, both medium and lateral, because you want to get the, the breadth of the insertion of the tendon. The same technique, uh, skin wheel, leather blade down to the pathology. Ultrasound is looking at the same uh, pictures of here on the right. I did my physicals for my college today. And a new young lady came in uh, who transferred in, and I asked about her injury. She said, well, she's 21. She said, I had Achilles rupture last year. So that's pretty, I said, you're 21. I said, you know, she said, yeah, they said it was almost complete rupture. They operated on it. I said, let me see. So I put her up, and I looked at the back, and I said, so tell me about your operation, because all you have is one little hole. She said, oh, so-and-so. Uh, and it turned out it was Jimmy's, it was Josh Ackle. Uh, he said he did it with this new technique, and I had the job done. So she is now an eight-month follow-up for a pretty severe Achilles tendinopathy treated with a PRP and a 10X, and she got approved today to play soccer. She's been playing that six months after. So we're starting to see some of these clinic results that may pop up in your office. So that was today. It was really nice to see that the, uh, that her, opera, her procedure went so well. She could return this, from this treatment, so I know it does work. To reiterate, You've got to find the area of mark maximum tenderness because that does correspond where the pathology is. The ultrasound confirms it. If you see it, you can treat it. Uh, we do prep and drape uh, just like you would for any procedure, like you would for steroid injection. This is a sterile technique. I do wear gloves, but I don't wear a mask or gown. Um, go down to the bone because you want to get all the way down. I can't emphasize enough. You've got to be able to reach it, and if you're a little far away with that knee, you may have difficulty getting the probe. One tip is to make that, that hole a little larger. Sometimes you can force the probe in the skin a little bit further than, than it might normally go. Skin and fascia probe is a back and forth, three to five millimeters. So that to and fro lets the, uh, lets the uh, machine work, whether it's, uh, whether it's exavisation or whether it's the jackhammer effect. But that tissue does get busted up and it gets sucked out. Um, and then you can look for visual crews uh, on your ultrasound to see where you're completing. For about a minute, um, I'm between 50, uh, maybe to 100, or between 50, maybe 70 seconds on most procedures we've done, uh, unless it's a larger, larger lease. 
Uh, I, I don't think they take the long it takes, but you've got to make sure you keep them comfortable with your lubricant. You don't want to take out as much the calcification does not have to be removed. You remove the tissue around it. So what do we do post doc? Well, uh, there is not a structured regimen. That's one thing that as the medical uh, staff we're working on trying to get a more regimented uh, post doc protocol because you're treating the same pathology, i.e. a tendon insertion or tendinopathy. So I give about some ice it down, tie off, rest. Well, the rest may be for the Achilles a walking boot. I do nothing for the patella tendon. Uh, the elbow, we say, just take it easy. So the tension is three, three, and three. Bernie's talking about three days to take these, another three weeks and use it sort of for normal activity. In the last three up to six weeks, you can do a little bit more, but you don't want to overdo. You don't want to do a lot of repetitive. Surely in the elbow, you don't want to do things in extension. You don't want to go back running and doing. Um, up to six weeks, we say resume your normal activities. And if you're going to do uh, a force like a, a, a jump in the air back to two eccentric or a concentric loading, it may take a little bit longer to make sure they're fully rehab. Um, we don't give anything else. So sort of walk in and walk out and put them right back to treatment. I bring my folks back that first uh, week or so just so I want to see how they're doing. And I see them again in a month. And a couple of them just called in because they've done uh, so very well. They, it's they needed to come back. So that's down and dirty. We've talked about results. Bernie talked about how the machine works, but the concept is you are using a needle, an 18 gauge needle, to, to deliver an energy ultrasound to remove a diseased tendon that is recognized by the machine, and you suck it out. The surgical procedure for tendonitis right now is resection, whether it's arthroscopic, whether it's open to resected disease testing. So all we're doing is another way of doing what has been done for years for treatment of chronic tendonitis. That's removed the disease tendon. This instance, so nature's going to fill that cavity, we think. Uh, we know the tissue will regenerate, and you've not destroyed anything either through an incision or had to make a go through normal tissue to get to the tissue. So in the future, uh, we really think that ultrasound any will be treated most tendinopathies, uh, disease tendon removed. Uh, it has to be worked out, be done in the clinical setting, because I think it has to be a little easier to get to. We're in the hospital now, uh, mainly for facility fees. It, it, some people will do them in surgery centers. Uh, and hopefully, we'll get to a clinical setting. Um, we can go early in treatment. Bernie showed you that uh, uh, most people respond by 20%, uh, don't respond by three months, and they linger, so perhaps three to four months. Maybe a little quicker. If I've got something I can do on the local, uh, it takes a minute or so, and it's, it's efficacious. I may start going a little earlier than my normal six months per chronic tendinopathy. Uh, it will be cost effective, is cost effective. And then we don't know what, what adjective treatment, PRP stem cells, uh, what we may have to help nature have to remove the tissue, to help nature regenerate and give us new tissue. So Bernie talked about Nirvana, uh, in other words, a, a place where uh, utopia place. Well, perhaps for tendinitis, uh, a percutaneous treatment. That's like a cortisone injection that you do every day or a local injection, but has sufficient your surgery without morbidity. Uh, that may be, we think, is it might be where we want to be, the treatment of tendinopathy in the future. And A10X uh, right now surely has, has a good start on accomplishing that. So, Bernie, I don't know what we want to have. you want to add to that or we want to start talking about the hard questions or where we want to go from here. I couldn't add a single word that is any more effective than what you said, Chan. Thanks so much, particularly recognizing that you have a very, very effective technique that you developed and you're still using this as kind of a first step and maybe reserving now the other for if something doesn't work. So excellent uh, perspective. I really appreciate it. So, you know, we've only got a few minutes left, uh, 10 minutes maybe, but We'd certainly be interested in people's questions and individuals' uh, questions. A lot of times they they uh, log on for a specific question. So that, let's open it up to see what people have to say. But thanks very much, Champ. Great, great perspective. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Baker, Dr. Mori. We certainly appreciate your comments. Uh, we do have a few questions that have been typed in. I'd like to run through those quickly, and then we'll open it up uh, to live questions. First question we have for Dr. Mori and Dr. Baker is how do you know you have removed enough of the diseased tissue? Is it by feel or only by ultrasound visualization? Well, the, the answer is yes. Um, 
with, with ultras, first of all, the pathologic lesion, 80% of the times is the hypoechoic area, which means it's a black tendon in the middle of a white normal tissue. Normal tendons look white on ultrasound. Degenerative tendons look black. When you treat them with uh, ultrasound, the black tendon, as Champ mentioned, turns white because of the uh, artifact of the nitrogen bubble. So you know that the black tendon has, quote, seen the energy. It's seen the light. So you can stop then. And I actually, I actually use the clock personally. So for tennis elbow, I can, you know, I know what the size of that lesion is. I've operated on a lot of them. I know what it looks like. And so that's about a 60 second. Patella tendon usually has a little larger uh, footprint, and that's about 90 seconds. Um, the Achilles tendon insertion, I go both medial and laterally, as uh, Champ showed. And that, I just did one yesterday, and that's about a minute and 30, a minute, well, maybe two, two minutes. Uh, plantar fascia is usually 90 seconds. So there's a time element, but you can also see the pathologic tissue change in appearance. And when you see the whole area that you're concerned about changing in its appearance, then it's time to stop. But, but importantly to this question, I've asked numerous, numerous, numerous um, uh, uh, physicians who use the technology, do they get worse if you treat them longer? In other words, if you're not sure and you just keep treating it, do they have more morbidity or more pain? And I'm amazed. They say, no, no, I don't see any difference. So if you, if you have a, an uncertainty, I think I would treat it a little bit longer rather than shorter uh, because the morbidity and the complications appear to be zero in almost both instances. I'd, I'd reiterate again that the, the difficulty with treating tendonitis surgically is that if you don't resect the tissue, you haven't resected the problem. And so uh, you have to get it all out, or a great majority of it out, to have successful outcomes. So I think Bernie's uh, one minute uh, for the, the simpler, which is epicondylitis, up to two minutes or even more, I think it's an atticus, an excellent way to do it. So you're looking how much you're, you're doing, uh, that helps. And then you're looking on the ultrasound, because you may not always say, I can see exactly what I've got now. So a combination of the two. And, and I, as long as you have them anesthetic, numbed up and up, where they're comfortable, I think there's not, there's not going to be a limit. Uh, if, if your local starts to wear off or you're in an area that it's not, they may feel discomfort, and that may want to uh, as a legion of shortness. Ted, that's actually a really good point. I know you got a lot of questions, maybe, but if you the, 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 every patient that I've done hurts more from the anesthetic. They do not feel the ultrasound. They don't feel the heat. They don't feel the the vibrations. They just don't feel it. So you should be pretty comfortable in doing it as long as you feel like you need to do it. Uh, and uh, I think that the again talking to high-level users that, that have used and, and done over 100 procedures and all say, if anything, they may be treating them a little bit longer just to be sure because they don't see any adverse effects to CHAMP's point. So I think that's something to just be aware of. Great. Next question for Dr. Morey and Dr. Baker. Uh, do any of the, do either of you have any experience utilizing the system with perineal tendinosis? Um, I do not, not yet. I, I, I imagine uh, Dr. Freed maybe. Uh, Bernie, I don't know if you can talk about what he's been doing. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, in, but I spent seven years in the foot clinic at Mayo before I kind of started drifting into uh, elbow, hip, and knee. And, um, uh, I have only done one, to be honest with you, but I will tell you, I've talked to a, sing a fair number of um, users, and, and most of them actually are podiatrists, and they tell me, you know, this really works well for, for perineal tendinosis or other ten an uh, ankle tendinosis, and uh, I think that's really good because I think it's really safe, but I've personally not used it. so. Is if you think I've got a perineal tendinosis that I think I'm looking at operating on, I use this in a nanosecond. 
But if you can say, well, it's not that bad, I'll treat it non-operatively, I would also support that in, in a second. So this fits in between the conservative management, which we all, everybody wants to do, and hopefully it works, and the surgical intervention, which we none want to do because we know there's a lot of morbidity. Uh, I think this fits in between, but in answer to your question, the company doesn't talk a lot about it, and we don't have data on it, but we have anecdotal comments on it, and, it, and people tell us, you know, it works pretty well for that too. So if you are interested, I think, I think it's safe, so I wouldn't object to you trying it. Next question for Drs. Baker and Morey, are there any contraindications? Obviously infection or cellulitis. Um, I think probably the only contraindication. Um, where we're using it, almost every 10 and almost every site you're going to put it, there, there's not going to be a major nerve around. And if you start sticking the back of the issue, tuberosity things in the back and the rear end, you, know, you may find a problem. Where we're, where we're treating it right now, so uh, you're hard to cause damage. And, and I would say unless um, they've got an active infection going on. I've done diabetics. It's, it's, it's a skin stick, a little incision. So I don't know of one right now. Bernie, do you? No, I, I, I completely agree with Champ. I, I did a patient yesterday who uh, actually has, as a young person, had a stroke and was on aspirin. And one of the most common questions is, can you do it? And I was really kind of reluctant, but she said, you know, please help me out here. I'm, I'm hurting you. She was a plantar fascia. And, uh, and I treated her, and she, uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't had a problem. So that's one thing you ask about, but so far uh, uh, the anticoagulation issue has not been a contraindication. Uh, Champ's uh, opinion, I think, is accurate, um, is, is, a, is accurate in the sense that um, you don't, if there's any uh, cellulitis or inflammation, don't fool with it. Although you should know that uh, ultrasound is bactericidal, and that's how they sterilize milk was with the ultrasound. It's how they sterilize food before they, before they put it in these packages. So, and we have an experiment in Lexington, Kentucky that shows that the level of ultrasound energy that we use in 10X is bactericidal. We're looking at that for another reason. So that's why there's such a low, 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 low incident. 30,000 cases, two infections, really low incidence because it's bactericidal. I think the other, he, here's where I'd characterize that question. I had a patient just uh, last week that had a chronic refractory um, tendinopathy, but it was an insertion tendinopathy of the pelvis. Uh, so, so it was, you know, a hamstring. And, and the, the issue is there's nothing else. There's nothing else. So when you're dealing with a non kind of a, 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 a perfect indication, the way I look at it is this. And here's what I tell them the likelihood of causing a problem is pretty low, very low. The likelihood of helping you, now this is where this is important, it's 50-50. I don't say it's 80%. I don't say it's 90%. I always say 50-50, but it appears to be safe. And when I've done that, the success has been 70-80. These are people that have failed surgery. They're out of the mainstream of what we want to treat. They're not people we want to treat, but they're desperate. But, you know, we all work on the risk-benefit ratio. That, that's the currency of the realm. And if the risk goes to zero, if the benefit is 50-50, it's still a very strong ratio. As Champ said earlier, if the risk is 10 or 20 percent, then you better have a very, very, very strong benefit expectation. So what I, what I keep coming back to, and I've done this, I've done over about 300. And, and I'm really compelled by the fact that it appears to be so safe if somebody is really desperate, I'll try it. But I never try it without telling somebody 50-50. And as Champ said in his presentation, if it's in the wheelhouse, if it's exactly what you want to see, if it's exactly what you expect, then I tell them the expectation is much higher. But if it's one of those weird presentations, I tell them 50-50, but it appears to be uh, uh, safe. So 
Yeah, you use your judgment. Next question for Dr. Baker and Dr. Morey. At what point do you introduce 10x into your treatment algorithm? I'm Ross, um, I've said three months. I, I, I would hesitate to see a patient one time if he's just had it for several weeks. Uh, as Bernie said, exercise, essential preferred, most 10 IVs, active rest, uh, ice, uh, avoid the precipitating activities will calm a lot of these down. But if you had uh, at least, now, I'm looking almost three and four, maybe down to three months for a, become almost a chronic prop who's done everything. I've seen him, he's, he's rehabbed, he's back at six weeks, not a lot of better. Three months, I'm saying, you know, uh, you may not want to do a study. I don't think everybody has to have an MRI at all. Uh, then I would say three months, I think it's early enough to go. I, I don't know that I'll get much quicker than that. Maybe in some instances, instances but uh, that they've had the problem, uh, I think three months is, is is a pretty good early timeline, Bernie. I don't know about you. I think it's a, a perfect. Uh, I can 100 percent agree. The thing that I the, the thing that I ask is, I know what the six month data are. So when they get to six months, they're actually in a little bit of trouble. So here's the specific question I ask them, and, and I completely agree with Champ. I usually ask them around three months or whenever they present in that three month interval or that window. Say. It's really simple to say, hey, listen, it's been going on this long. You've been doing this and this and this. Now look them in the eye and say, if I tell you to wait it out and you're going to be okay, would you believe me? And if they say, I don't know. I don't think this is going to get any better. Then I talk to them about Tenex. And if they say, well, you know, maybe it's getting a little better. The key is at three months, are they getting better, worse, or the same? That's the central question I ask. So I see them at that three-month interval, that window. I say, are you better or worse than the same? If they say, I'm getting a little better, I pat them on the head. Say, good on you. If they say, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm getting worse, then I definitely talk to them about this. If they say, well, you know, I'm about the same. Then I, that's the group I say, if I tell you you're going to be okay at six months, would you believe me? And if they look at me and say, well, you know, I'm not really sure about that. And, and particularly, this is interfering with my ability to do drywalling or carpentry or plumbing or you know, physical stuff, then I think it's not ethical not to mention something that might actually get them back. And so I, I completely agree with Champ on that. Those are just a few additional questions I ask. So our next question, how do you differentiate between uh, a tear versus scar tissue under ultrasound since they both look hypoechoic? Do you ever order MRIs to confirm the tear versus scar damaged tissue. Well, let my daddy answer that one. <laughs> well, um, you know, when you're first starting, and, and if you rely a lot on MRI, I think it's okay to see what that shows. Um, I don't order it personally, but I don't object to people ordering. Um, we, we have not been able to, I, I've done a number of people that have failed surgery and I've done a number of people that the MRI said not tendinopathy but a tear of the extensor mechanism. And the lexicon of a radiologist is different from the lexicon of a surgeon. Uh, so what I, um, what I do is I just take it face up on the clinical presentation. So I've done a number of people where the MRI said tear of the extensor tendon, which implies it's torn and retracted. And I still treat them and there's no difference if they have those acute features and all. So I don't, I, and, I, and I don't think you need the MRI. Ultrasound is an imaging modality. There's tremendous amount of data that shows it's as reliable as MRI, but it depends on how comfortable you are. And if you say, I just don't want to do this unless I get an MRI, then that's fine. I, I personally have no problem with in my practice, I don't order MRIs. I use a plain x-ray to make sure there's no underlying pathology, and then I do the ultrasound as my imaging modality. So I think it's whatever you feel most comfortable with. All right, our next question. Can you correlate treatment response recovery time to findings noted on a diagnostic ultrasound? The bigger the lesion, the longer it takes. To and maybe I'll start with that. Uh, yeah. 
Is that what you mean? To yeah, uh, not not directly. I've had people that I thought I did a great job and 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 took longer time, and I've had people that I thought, oh, oh it's kind of like chimps that it didn't quite reach the pathology or there was something, and um, and yet they come back and give you the big hug and say, man, you cured me in a week or two, and so. There's not a direct correlation. I will say, just to be on, uh, to be totally honest, it you have to believe that the better you are with the technique, the better you are with treating the footprint of the pathology, the better you are with visualizing it, the better the patient will do. I mean, you can't hardly argue against that. But anecdotally, as we've looked at things, it, it's kind of it, 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 I can't prove it with the data. I just feel that's the case. Brad, next question we have is, uh, can 10X be used to remove painful calcifications that have been confirmed to be painful after diagnostic lidocaine injection? Well, um, maybe again I'll try this. Um, I personally don't uh, believe that calcium itself hurts. I think calcium is like a stop sign, which I try to avoid most of my life, but I have to accept some of them. But calcium says there's a lesion here. There's either a change in the PaO2 or the oxygen tension that's allowed calcium to form in that area. And it's just like waving your hands and say, look at me, here I am. So when I, and to me that means tendinopathy. So um, I have some colleagues who believe that if they see calcium on the plain films, they actually try to get rid of it. Uh, I don't. I treat the tendinopathy around it. Um, if you turn the module, the energy on high, uh, that energy level doesn't have as much pulsation to it. It's the same energy, less uh, downtime, less um, rest time. And that will emulsify calcium. But, but we can't say that because we didn't ask for that as the FDA approval. FDA approval says degenerative tissue, not calcium. So I can't really talk on it, except the energy will do it. I don't know that it's necessary. If you feel it's necessary or if your patient thinks that's what's causing the pain and the contract that you negotiate with the patient is, I'll get rid of your pain and in so doing I'll get rid of your calcium you better get rid of the calcium. And it, and you can do it with this instrument. It takes a little longer or a little bit longer, I mean moderately longer because you got to keep pulverizing that until it's gone. But um, I don't think it's necessary, but you can do it. Okay, we have two more written questions and we'll open up briefly for some live questions and then we'll adjourn. We're, we're coming upon a little over an hour here. But uh, the next question for Dr. Maureen, Dr. Baker, is what effect does the ultrasonic energy have to surrounding healthy tendon tissue? Uh, Bernie, I think you showed with, with your slides before money, it does not affect uh, the wavelength between disease to uh, tendon and, and normal tendon at such a length that this uh, selective wavelength of the machine is, is, um, is uh, since you made for it, does not affect uh, healthy tissue. Yeah, uh, that that that's exactly right. In the lab, we looked at it. To me, what what is really important, and this is a real important principle. So we've done about thirty thousand, and we've had one tendon rupture, and that one out of thirty thousand, and that patient had a seventy percent rupture, was on fluoroquinolone, and had ten x in order to avoid surgery for the impending rupture. So the surgeon said, you're going to rupture this tendon and uh, there's this new technology. We might be able to keep it from rupturing if we treat you with this. So he treated with 10X and a month later he ruptured. And I called the guy. I actually talked to him because he's the only tendon rupture in the company's experience of 30,000 cases. And I said, well, I'm really sorry about the complications. Oh, he didn't know what I was talking about. He said, well, they told me it was going to rupture. We were just trying to keep it, avoiding it from happening. He said 10X wasn't successful keeping it from happening. It didn't really cause it because it was going to happen anyhow. 
So as of this moment, in terms of nor, uh, ordinarily kind of circumstances, we haven't had a tendon ruptured, and so you could say, no, it 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 does, you know, it affects normal tissue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if it does that, you would expect a higher complication rate than zero, or one out of thirty thousand. So um, it it appears as though our experimental data, or our observational data, and our clinical data would suggest it really doesn't harm normal tissue. All right, this is our last written question, and we'll open it up briefly after this for uh, any live questions. But uh, the last question here was, uh, can you comment on plantar fibroma and Morton's neuroma applications? I don't think Champ knows this, so I'll answer. The guy Patel the Champ talked about is from Ortho, Indiana. He trained at special surgery, and he has a paper that has just been accepted. That's why it wasn't in our discussion on plantar fibromas. He's done 10 plantar fibromas over the last two years. And he's an early adopter, so he's been doing it for four years, um, doing doing 10x for four years. And he said he's had no recurrence in the 10. But I don't know. Plantar fibromas do recur. I'm sure that we'll, some of those 10 may recur. But with a minimum of follow-up of a year and up to two years, they haven't recurred. So. Fibroma is a scar ball. This seems to be effective in that setting, and um, I think it's reasonable to try it. I, I wouldn't guarantee it, but his experience says, hey, Bernie, it really seems to work pretty well. So that's the only data that I have. Morton's neuroma, I don't know. I, I, I was in the foot clinic for seven years, as I said, and I always were. I hate nerves just for what it's worth. I hate them. And, um, if you resect a nerve, you get a neuroma, and the neuromas may or may not hurt. So I feel very nervous about saying use this for a neuroma. So I would say I, I can't recommend it. All right. So in, uh, out of respect for everyone's time, uh, we're just going to take a couple of questions here live. So in a moment, Nathan, I'll have you uh, take everybody off mute, but in, in anticipation of that, if you don't have a question, you just want to listen in, please put your phone on mute because we're going to take you off of mute via the web webinar system and it can get a little loud. So if you all could please put your phones on mute unless you do have a question and uh, we'll go ahead and take those right now. Uh, Nathan, can you go ahead and unmute everyone? Yeah, I'm starting now. All right. We'll just take a moment here for get everybody unmuted. <laughs> once again, if <laughs> once again, if you don't don't have a question, please please put your personal phone on mute, and uh, that will allow everyone to, to hear those live questions easier. And it looks like we are going down the list here, unmuting everyone. Okay, so uh, why don't we open it up? If you have a question for Dr. Moore or Dr. Baker, please go ahead and ask. Hey guys, this is Tim out in California. Hey Tim. So I um I understand that the sweet spot of our patient targeting is somewhere between six and twelve months. And I know Dr. Moore, you had mentioned maybe about the three month time frame rather than six months. Um, I'd say, let, can I explore with you what the outside end looks like? So if you've got a patient that has been having these symptoms for more than a year, uh, I know you said you often drop down the percentage outcome rate, but should we, should we caution our surgeons that are adopting this, our, our clinicians, and, and tell them that over a year you know, we should be a little more cautious about this, or do you still think full speed ahead? Well, I think it's kind of like Champ said. This is an alternative to surgery, and if, in the quote olden days, if we saw somebody at one or two years, and they said, "Doc, you got to do something," we like that because this was an indication for surgery or our arthroscopic intervention because we knew that nothing else was working. So, um, I I actually am very comfortable with the outside range. The most common question is the one we've been dealing with. 
Wesley, earlier should intervene. There is no outside right. I, I have a patient that I operated on or did the mechanics on that was seven years with okay. recurring symptoms. It actually did very well, so I don't think there's an outside range because what okay. happens is the, 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 the risks are so low, no harm, no foul. I mean, you try it. If it doesn't work, you can talk about other options, but if it does work, everybody does a high five. So short answer is no, there's no outside limits. Try it. Got it. Thank you. Thanks for asking. I've appreciated the call today. Oh, thanks for joining in early in your uh, clinic day. So appreciate it. Any other questions for Dr. Baker and Dr. Mori? I think it's late. I think it is, and I appreciate everyone. I know we've gone over a little bit. I want to thank Dr. Baker and Dr. Mori for their generous time and their eloquent presentations tonight, and thank all of our attendees for taking time out of your schedule to spend with us to learn about 10X this evening. Thanks to all of you. We look forward to following up with you. And uh, if you have any further questions, uh, you can reach out to your local 10X rep, and we can get those questions to Dr. Mori and Dr. Baker for you. Uh, thank you all very much, and have a great evening. Well, thanks. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, I, I know you made a special effort. Thanks, everybody, for taking time out of your day. We appreciate it.